Act 5 I know this is wrong, but stronger than my conscience is my fury. Euripides, Medea Chapter 1 Lana woke up in the dark. She wasn't sure where she was or what the time was. She felt groggy and confused. Her eyes slowly adjusted to the gloom, and she made out the shape of a large window with its curtains drawn. Tinges of light were appearing around the edges, creeping in from outside. It's morning, she thought, and I'm on Elliot's couch. As she took in the debris surrounding her, from the carnage last night, the coffee table strewn with empty bottles of wine, bottles of vodka, various glasses, loose marijuana buds, ashtrays overflowing with joints and cigarette ends, her memory returned. She had come over here late last night. The reason for her visit also came back to her. The discovery of Kate and Jason's affair. And she was flooded with pain. Lana lay still for a moment. She felt so sad, weary, utterly broken. It took an effort to summon the strength to stand up. She managed to lean on the arm of the couch and pulled herself up. She got to her feet. Slightly unsteadily, she started gathering her things. Then, across the room, she saw the figure of a man, fast asleep, face down at the desk. It's Elliot, she thought. She cautiously made her way through the wreckage. She stood above the desk. She watched me sleep for a moment. Memories of last night came back to her, and she remembered, when she needed a friend the most, when she was desperate, out of her depth, Elliot Chase was there, supporting her, holding her up, keeping her head above water. He is my rock, she thought. Without him, I'd drown. Despite herself, Lana smiled suddenly, remembering that crazy plan of revenge we had concocted together at the height of her lunacy. We got carried away, but we were carried away together, partners in crime. Partners. As she stood there looking at me, she felt such love in that moment. It felt as though, in Lana's mind, I were emerging from a mist, stepping out of a fog. She felt she was seeing me clearly for the first time. He looks just like a little kid. She studied my face affectionately. She knew the face so well, but had never looked closely at it before. It was a pale face, weary-looking. A sad face, unloved. No, that's not true, she thought. He is loved. I love him. And then, peering at me in the dim light, Lana experienced a life-changing moment of clarity. She understood that not only did she love me, but she had always loved me. Not with the mad passion that Jason had inspired in her, perhaps but with something quieter, more lasting, and deeper. A great love, a true love, born of mutual respect and repeated acts of kindness. Here, at last, was a man on whom she could depend, a man she could trust, a man who would never leave her, or cheat on her, or lie to her. He would only give her what she needed most. He would give her companionship, kindness, and love. Lana felt a sudden urge to wake me up, to tell me how much she loved me. I'll leave Jason, she was about to say, and you and I can be together, my love, and we can be happy, forever and ever, and... Lana reached out to touch my shoulder, but something made her stop. My notebook was on the desk, under my right hand. It was open, and its pages were covered with scribbled writing. It looked like a draft of a script, perhaps, or a scene from a play. One word jumped out at her. Lana. She peered at it more closely. Other words popped out at her. Kate. Jason, and Gun. It had to be that mad idea from last night. Silly man, she thought. He must have begun writing it down before he passed out. I'll make him destroy it when he wakes up. Lana assumed that, like her, I'd wake up sober and wiser. She hesitated a moment, then curiosity got the better of her. Carefully, so as not to wake me, she slid out the notebook from under my hand. She went and stood by the window. She held it up to the cracks of light and began to read. As she read the notebook, Lana frowned, confused. She didn't understand what she was reading. It didn't make sense. So she turned back a few pages, then a few more. Then she went all the way back to the first page and read it from the beginning. As Lana stood there, she began to make sense of what she was looking at, and her fingers trembled. Her teeth chattered. She felt out of control. She felt like screaming. Get out, howled the voice inside her. Get out, get out, get out, get out. She made a decision. She was about to stuff the notebook into her bag, but thought better of it. She replaced the open notebook on the desk, edging it under my fingers. Just as I was beginning to stir, Lana crept out of my flat. She left without making a sound. 
Chapter 2 It was early morning when Lana stumbled out of my building. The daylight felt overwhelming to her, blinding her, and she shielded her eyes from it, keeping her head low as she walked. Her heart was pounding in her chest, her breathing coming thick and fast. She felt like her legs might give way, but she managed to keep going. She didn't know where she was headed. All she knew was that she had to get as far away as possible from the words she had read and the man who had written them. As she walked, she tried to make sense of what she had seen in the notebook. It felt horrendous, and too much to take in. Looking at those pages was like peering into the fractured mind of a madman, a glimpse into hell. At first, she had had the disconcerting impression she had been reading her own diary. There was so much of her in it. It was full of her words, her ideas, her sayings, her observations about the world, even her dreams. All faithfully recorded, and written down in the first person as if she herself were writing it. It felt like an acting exercise, almost, as if she were being studied, as if she were a character in a play, not a real person. Even worse, and more painful to read, was the long catalog of meetings between Jason and Kate, which went on for several pages. Each entry was neatly dated, its location noted, with a summary of what had taken place. There was a list titled, Lana, with a column of possible clues to be planted in her house, to make her suspicious of Jason's infidelity. Another list, Jason, sketched out a variety of alternative methods by which he might be disposed of, but that list had been crossed out. Evidently, none of the proposed methods had proved satisfactory. Finally, in the notebook's last pages, written, then rewritten, was a bizarre plot to drive Kate to murder Jason on the island. Even more disturbingly, it was written as a play, including dialogue and stage directions. Lana shuddered, thinking about it. She felt as if she, too, had gone mad. The last time she had felt this kind of unreality was when she had discovered the earring. The earring, which, according to the notebook, had been planted for her to find. Was this possible? She struggled to reconcile the words she had read with the man who had wrote them, a man she thought she knew and loved. That's what made it so painful, the love she had. This betrayal felt so profound, so visceral. It felt like a physical wound, a gaping hole. It couldn't be true. Had her best friend really lied to her? Had he manipulated her, isolated her, schemed to end her marriage, and now planned an actual murder? Lana knew she had to go to the police with this. Right now, this second. She had no choice. Emboldened by this decision, she started walking faster. She would go straight to the police station, and she would tell them. Tell them what? About the scribbled rantings of a madman? Would she not look crazy, turning up with garbled accusations of gaslighting affairs and murder plots? Her pace slowed as she played it out in her mind. The story would get out, almost immediately. She'd be on the front page of every tabloid in the world tomorrow. Enough material was there to keep the papers busy for weeks, months. No, she couldn't allow that. For Leo's sake, as well as her own. Going to the police was not a possibility. Then what? What else could she do? She had no more options. Her footsteps faltered and came to a halt. She stood still, in the middle of the pavement. She didn't know what to do, or where to go. The street wasn't busy, it was too early. A handful of people walked past, mostly ignoring her, apart from an impatient man who sighed heavily. Come on, love, he said, pushing past her. Get out of the bloody way. This prompted Lana to move, to put one foot in front of the other and keep going. She didn't know where to go, so she just kept walking. Eventually, she found herself in Euston. She wandered into the train station and, feeling tired, she sank down onto a bench. She was exhausted. This was the second brutal psychological assault she had endured in as many days. The first was the discovery of the affair between Jason and Kate, which had prompted an outpouring of emotion, tears, and hysteria. But Lana had used up all her tears. She had none left for this second betrayal. She felt unable to cry or feel. She only felt weary and confused. She was finding it hard even to think. Lana sat there on the bench for about an hour. Her head remained bowed as the station came to life around her. No one noticed her. She was invisible, another lost soul, ignored by the steady stream of commuters. Eventually, someone saw her. An old man who, like Lana, had nowhere to go. He shuffled close to her. He stank of booze. Cheer up, sweetheart. Things can't be that bad. Then peering more closely... Say, you look familiar. Don't I know you? Lana didn't look up, didn't reply, just kept shaking her head. Eventually, the old man gave up. He ambled off. 
Anna forced herself up. She walked out of the station just as the pub across the road was opening its doors. She hesitated and considered going inside, but she decided against it. She didn't need to get drunk. She needed her mind to be absolutely clear. As she walked past the pub, she found herself thinking about Barbara West. Suddenly, Lana was flooded with the memories that she had worked so hard to forget. She recalled all the things Barbara had said to her about Elliot, that he was dangerous, that he was crazy. Lana had refused to believe her. She had insisted that Elliot was a good man, loving and kind. But she had been wrong. Barbara was telling the truth. Now, as Lana walked, she felt herself coming into focus. She found herself thinking more clearly, with more fluidity. She knew her purpose now. She knew what must be done. She dreaded doing it, but she had no choice. She had to know the truth. So she walked all the way from Houston to Maida Vale. She went up to the front door of a Victorian terraced house in Little Venice. She stood on the doorstep, keeping her finger pressed on the buzzer, until there were angry footsteps in the hall, and the door was thrown open by the owner, in a rage. What the hell? Kate looked afright. She had only recently got to sleep after a heavy night. Her hair was messy, and her makeup smeared. Her anger evaporated when she saw it was Lana. What are you doing here? What's wrong? Lana stared at her. She said the first thing that came to her head. Are you fucking my husband? Kate breathed in sharply practically a gasp. Then, in the same breath, she let out a long, slow, audible sigh. Oh, Jesus. Lana, it's over. I ended it. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This wasn't much, but somehow this truthful exchange provided a tiny base, a stepping stone from which to proceed. The truth liberated them, or at least opened the door a crack. Finally, the two women could talk honestly. Lana went inside and sat at Kate's kitchen table, They sat there for hours and talked and cried. They were more honest with each other than they had been for years. All the misunderstandings, crossed wires, hurt feelings, lies, suspicions, they all came tumbling out. Kate confessed her feelings for Jason, there since the first day she met him. She buried her head in her hands and wept. I loved him, Kate said quietly, and you took him from me, Lana. It hurt so much. I tried to let go. I tried to forget, but I couldn't. So you tried to take him back? Is that it? I tried, Kate shrugged. He doesn't want me. It's you he wants. My money, you mean? I don't know. I know that you and me, that's real. That's love. Can you ever forgive me? I can try, Lana smiled faintly. Perhaps this moving reconciliation isn't that surprising. Lana and Kate were closer than ever now. They were united. After all, they had a common enemy now. Me. Chapter 3 Kate furiously chain-smoked cigarettes as she listened, incredulous, to Lana's story. Fucking hell, she said, her eyes wide in amazement. Elliot is evil. I know. What are we going to do? Lana shrugged. I don't know. I can't think. I can't believe it's happening. I can. Kate laughed grimly. Trust me. Despite her initial astonishment, Kate found the news of my deception much easier to accept than Lana. Kate had had an instinctive mistrust for me for years. Now, at last, she felt vindicated, even triumphant, and justified in seeking retribution. We cannot let that bastard get away with this, Kate said as she stubbed out her cigarette. We have to do something. We can't go to the police, not with a story like this. No, I know. Honestly, I don't know how seriously they take us. To understand how fucking sick this is, you need to know him. You need to know what a psychopath he is. Kate. Do you think he's crazy? I do. Of course he is. Mad as a hatter. Kate poured them a couple of whiskeys. I warned you years ago, remember? I told you not to trust him. I knew there was something weird about him. You should never have let him get close to you. That was your mistake. Lana didn't say anything for a moment, then said quietly, I think I'm a little afraid of him. Kate frowned. That's exactly why we can't let him win. Do you understand? We have to act. Have you told Jason? No, I've only told you. You must tell him. Not yet. What about Elliot? Kate gave her a curious look. Are you going to confront him? No, Lana shook her head. He mustn't find out we know. Don't underestimate him, Kate. He's dangerous. I know he is. Then what do we do? There's only one thing we can do. And what's that? Lana fixed her eyes on Kate and didn't speak for a second. When she did, her voice was without emotion, simply stating a matter of fact. 
We must destroy him, Lana said, or he'll kill Jason. They stared at each other. Kate nodded slowly. But how? They sat in silence for a moment, mulling it over, as they sipped their whiskeys. Suddenly, Kate looked up, her eyes sparkling. I've got it. We beat him at his own game. Meaning? We play along. We follow his script. Then, as soon as he thinks it's all going according to plan, we turn the tables on him. We write him a different ending. One he wasn't expecting. One that will be the end of him. Lana thought about this. Then she nodded. Okay. Kate raised her glass to make a toast. To revenge. No. Lana raised her glass. To justice. Yes, justice. The two women solemnly drank to the success of their production. The curtain went up immediately. That afternoon, in fact, when tired and hungover, I made my way to Lana's house. Love, I said, I came over to check on you. I was worried when I woke up and you were gone. And you've not been answering your phone. Are you okay? I'm fine, said Lana. I was going to wake you, but you look so peaceful. I feel rough as hell now. We drank far too much last night. Talking of which, how about hair of the dog? Lana nodded. Why not? We went into the kitchen, and I opened a bottle of champagne. Then I gently began to remind Lana what we had spoken about last night. I encouraged her to go ahead with our plan, to lure Kate and Jason to the island. That's if you still want to proceed, I said casually. I waited. I noticed Lana was finding it hard to look at me, but I put it down to her hangover. She forced a smile in my direction. Nothing could stop me. Good. Then at my suggestion, Lana reached for her phone. She rang up Kate, who was at the old Vic. Kate answered the phone quickly. Hey, you okay? I will be. I've worked out what we all need is some sunshine. Will you come? What? Kate sounded mystified. To the island, for Easter. Lana went on in a cheery tone before Kate could respond. Don't say no. It'll just be us. You, me, Jason, and Leo. And Agathy, of course. I'm not sure if I'll ask Elliot. He's been annoying me lately. This alerted Kate that Lana wasn't alone, that I was in the room with her. Kate understood. She smiled and played along. She nodded. I'm booking my flight right now. Chapter 4 They didn't tell the others about the plan until they were on the island. Lana kept putting off telling Agathy. She felt sure Agathy would refuse to participate. In the end, Lana was wrong about that. Agathy proved an all-too-willing participant in the evening's festivities. Lana told Leo about it on the second day, at the picnic on the beach. She suggested they have a walk together. Darling, said Lana in a low voice as they strolled along the water's edge, arm in arm, there's something you should know. There's going to be a murder tonight. Leo listened, amazed, as his mother explained the practicalities of the plot. To his credit, Leo felt a flicker of uncertainty, an uneasy feeling that what Lana was suggesting was morally wrong, and that there would be some terrible price to pay. But he quickly banished the thought. As a budding actor, he knew he couldn't turn her down. He'd never get offered a part like this again. The fact that Leo detested me helped him overcome his scruples. He figured I had it coming. Perhaps he was right. Telling Jason, however, was rather trickier. Lana attempted to talk to him that afternoon after the beach. She snuck off to find Jason at the ruin where he was hunting. But Jason wasn't alone. Kate was with him. As Lana watched them kissing, she flew into a rage. It took a while to calm herself down. Then she confronted Kate on the speedboat on the way to Yalos. You said it was over, said Lana in a low voice, you and him. What? It is over. Why did you kiss him? At the ruin? Elliot was watching us. I could see him there, hiding. I had to play along. I had no choice. Well, you were very convincing. Congratulations. Kate accepted the rebuke with a shrug. Fine. I deserve that. She gave Lana a wary look. When are you going to tell Jason? You need to warn him. Lana shook her head. I'm not going to tell him. What? Kate stared at her, astonished. If he doesn't know, it won't work. I'll never be able to talk him into it. Oh, you can be very persuasive when you want. Think of it as an acting challenge. You can't do this to Jason. You can't put him through that. That's his punishment. That's so fucked up, Kate pulled a face. And I have to watch it? Yes, Lana nodded. That's yours. A few hours later, Lana stood outside that summer house window. She watched Kate perform inside, all for an audience of one. Jason didn't mean to shoot Lana. 
I said. He meant to shoot you. Kate shook her head. You're sick. You're fucking sick. Kate ran through the gamut of emotions in this scene. Paranoid, fearful, angry. It was a bravura performance, if a little over the top, in Lana's opinion. Kate's overdoing it, she thought. But he seems convinced. How smug he is. How vain. If he had any self-awareness at all, he'd see through her. But he thinks he's so clever, he thinks he's some kind of god, but he'll learn. He'll be humbled. Inside the summer house, I took out the gun, pressing it into Kate's hands. Then I sent her out to meet Jason at the jetty. Lana lurked in the darkness, waiting. She stepped onto the path in front of Kate. Their eyes met, and they exchanged guns. Break a leg, Lana said. Kate didn't say anything. She stared at Lana for a second. Then she turned and walked away. Lana followed me down to the beach. She positioned herself in the dark, a little way behind where I was standing. She sent Nikos over to accost me, to march me at gunpoint to the jetty, where I was humiliated, brutalized, and beaten. Lana watched all this, her blue eyes glowing in the dark, like a vengeful goddess, cruel, pitiless. As I, her victim, was forced onto my knees, begging for mercy, screaming her name, until a gunshot silenced me and Lana's revenge was complete. Chapter 5 I promised you a murder, didn't I? Bet you never thought it would be mine. Well, sorry to disappoint you. I wasn't dead. I just thought I was. I really believed my last moment on Earth had come. That gunshot made me pass out, scared to death, you might say. I was nudged awake by a prodding foot. Wake him up, Kate said. Nico's foot nudged me again, harder this time. I opened my eyes, and the world came into focus. I was lying on the ground, on my side. I pulled myself up to a sitting position, and gingerly touched the side of my head, feeling for any sign of a bullet wound. Relax, said Kate. They're blanks. She threw the gun onto the ground. It's a prop gun. Ah, I thought, of course. Kate was an actress, not a murderer. I should have known. Judging by the look on his face, Jason was even more surprised than I was that I was still breathing. What the fuck? Jason stared at Kate, incredulous. What is going on? I'm sorry, I wanted to tell you. She wouldn't let me. Who? What are you talking about? Kate was about to reply, then fell silent, as she glimpsed Lana on the beach. Jason followed Kate's gaze, and he stared, open-mouthed, aghast, as Lana walked across the sand to the jetty. She was holding Leo's hand. Behind them, the sun was rising, and the sky was streaked with red. Lana and Leo climbed up the jetty steps. They joined the others. Lana? Jason said. What the fuck? What is this? Lana ignored Jason, as if he hadn't spoken. She took hold of Kate's hand and clasped it. They stared at each other for a second. Then they turned and faced me. They were all standing in a line, all of them, like actors in a curtain call. Lana, Kate, Agathe, Nikos, Leo. Only Jason stood to one side, out of place, confused. Even I had a better understanding of what had happened than he did. In fact, I understood all too well. I got to my feet with some difficulty. I clapped sarcastically three times. I tried to speak, but my mouth filled with blood. I spat the blood on the ground. I tried again. It wasn't easy with a broken jaw. All I could manage was one word. Why? In response, Lana produced my notebook. You shouldn't leave this lying around. She threw it at me hard, hitting me in the chest. I thought you were different, she said. I thought you were my friend. You're no one's friend. You're nothing. I didn't recognize Lana. She sounded like a different person. Hard, ruthless. She looked at me with hatred. There's no other word to describe that look. Lana, please, stay away from me, she said. Stay away from my family. If I see you again, ever, you're going to jail. She turned to Agathe. Get him the fuck off the island. Then Lana turned to go and Jason reached out to touch her. She batted away his hand like it revolted her. Without looking back, she went down the steps. She walked alone across the sand. There was a momentary pause, then the mood abruptly changed. Leo broke the silence with a sudden peal of laughter. High-pitched, childish laughter. He was pointing at me and laughing. Look, he pissed himself. What a freak. Kate laughed and took Leo's arm. She gave it a squeeze. Come on, love, let's go. They walked over to the steps. Your acting was amazing, Leo said. You were so real. I want to be an actor, too. I know. Your mother told me. I think it's a wonderful idea. Will you teach me? I can certainly give you a few tips. 
Kate smiled. Of course, the most important thing is to have a good audience. She threw me one last look of triumph. Then she turned and walked down the steps. Leo followed, and so did the others. They made their way in a procession across the sand. Kate and Leo were first, and a little behind them, Nico supported Agathe with his arm. Jason trailed behind them, his head bent forward, his fists clenched in anger. I could hear Kate and Leo talking as they walked away. I don't know about you, Kate was saying, but I think this calls for a celebratory drink. How about a very expensive bottle of bubbly? Good idea. Maybe I'll even have a glass. Oh, Leo. Kate kissed his cheek. There is hope for you after all. As they walked farther off, their voices faded, but I could still hear Leo's childish laughter. It echoed in my head. If I had any sense, I'd stop now. I'd pay for your drinks and hastily stagger out of this bar, leaving you with a cautionary tale and no forwarding address. I'd get out of town quick before I said something I shouldn't. But I must go on. I have no choice. This has been looming over me from the start, casting its shadow on me, ever since I first sat down to tell you the story. You see, my portrait is not complete. Not yet. It needs a few details filled in. A few final brushstrokes here and there to finish it. Strange, I use that word. Portrait. I suppose it is a portrait, but of whom? Initially, I thought it was a portrait of Lana. But now, I'm beginning to suspect it's of me which is a frightening thought. It's not something I wish to look at, this hideous rendering of myself. But we must confront it together one last time, you and I, to finish this tale. I warn you, it's not a pretty sight. Chapter 6 It was dawn. I was alone on the jetty. I was in a lot of pain. I didn't know what hurt the most, my aching lower back, where Nikos hit me with a gun, my cracked ribs or my throbbing jaw. I winced as I lurched down the steps onto the beach. I didn't know where I was going. I had nowhere to go. So I just hobbled along the sand beside the surf. As I walked, I tried to make sense of what had taken place. Suffice to say, my plan hadn't worked out as I had hoped. In my version, Lana and I would be together now, at the house, waiting for the police to arrive. I'd be comforting her, explaining that Jason's death was an unfortunate, even tragic accident. I had no idea things would get so out of hand, I would say to Lana, fighting tears, that Kate would actually take the gun and use it. I'd tell Lana I would never get over the terrible sight I had witnessed of Kate repeatedly shooting Jason on the beach in a wild, drunken rage. That would be my story, and I'd stick to it. Kate might tell a different tale to mine, but it would be my word against hers. That would be all that was left now. Words, recollections, accusations, suggestions, all blowing in the wind. Nothing real, nothing tangible. The police, and more important, Lana, would believe me over Kate, who had, after all, just murdered Lana's husband in cold blood. I feel so guilty, I would say. It's all my fault. No, Lana would reply. It's mine. I never should have agreed to this crazy idea. I talked you into it. I'll never forgive myself. Never. And so on. We would comfort each other, each taking the blame. We would be distraught, but we would recover, and we would be united. She and I, united in our guilt. We'd live happily ever after. That's how it was supposed to end. Except Lana saw my notebook. Which was unfortunate. It read badly, I can see that. Words written in anger. Ideas taken out of context. Private fantasies not meant to be seen. Certainly not by Lana. If only she had woken me up right then when she found it. If she had confronted me, I could have explained it all. I could have made her understand. But she didn't give me that chance. Why not? Surely she had discovered equally terrible things about Kate over the past few days. Yet Lana found it within herself to forgive her. Why not me? I imagine it was Kate who came up with the idea. Like me, she was always having bright ideas. How they must have enjoyed scripting it, then rehearsing their performances. How they must have laughed at me the whole time, watching me make a fool of myself on the island. Allowing me to presume I was the author of this play, when I was just its audience. How could Lana do this to me? I didn't understand how she could be so cruel. This punishment far exceeded my crime. I had been humiliated, terrified, stripped of all dignity, all humanity, reduced to nothing but snot and tears, to a kid sniveling in the dirt. So much for friendship, so much for love. As I walked, I felt increasingly angry. I felt as if I were back at school, bullied, abused. Except this time there was no hope of escape, no future happiness with Mama to look forward to. I was trapped here for eternity. 
Without realizing it, I found myself back at the ruin. I was standing in the circle of broken columns. The ruin was eerie and desolate in the dawn light. Along with the dawn had come the wasps. Wasps were everywhere, suddenly, swarming in the air around me, like a black mist. Wasps, crawling all over the marble columns, crawling on the ground. They were crawling over my hand as I thrust it into the rosemary bush. Wasps crawled all over the gun as I pulled it out. I was about to walk away when I saw something that made me freeze. They say the wind drives you mad, and that must be what happened to me. I must have been driven momentarily insane, for I was witnessing something that couldn't possibly be real. There, in front of me, gusts of wind were rushing together from all directions, swirling together, forming a giant spiral of wind, a whirlwind twisting and turning in the air. Around it, the air was perfectly still, no hint of breeze, not a leaf moving. All the violence and rage of the gale was concentrated here in this whirling mass. I stared at it, awestruck, for I understood what it was. I knew, with utter certainty, this was Aura herself. This was the goddess, terrifying, vengeful, and full of rage. She was the wind, and she had come for me. As soon as I thought this, the wind rushed toward me. It entered my open mouth, ran down my throat, and filled up my body. It made me expand, grow, and swell. My lungs nearly burst with it. It coursed through my veins, it swirled around my heart. The wind consumed me, and I became it. I became the Fury. Chapter 7 Lana walked into the kitchen. She was followed by the others, but she barely registered their presence. She looked out the window at the brightening sky. She was deep in thought, but with no confusion or distress. She felt strangely calm, as though she'd had a restful night and had just awoken from a deep sleep. She felt clear, in a way she hadn't for a long time. You might suppose her mind would be on me, but you'd be wrong. I had faded almost entirely from her thoughts, as if I had never existed. With my departure, a new clarity appeared. Everything Lana had felt so scared of, all the loneliness, loss, remorse, meant nothing to her now. All the human relationships she had deemed so necessary for her happiness meant nothing. She saw the truth at last, that she was alone and always had been. Why had they been so frightening? She didn't need Kate nor Jason. She would set them free, all of them. She would release her hostages. She would buy Agathy some land in Greece, a house, and a life, instead of demanding she sacrifice herself to Lana's fear. Lana was no longer afraid. She would let Leo live his own life, pursue his own dreams. Who was she to hold on to him, to cling to him? And Jason? She would throw him onto the street. Let him go to jail. Let him go to hell. He meant nothing to her now. She couldn't wait to leave. She wanted to get as far away from this island as possible. She never wanted to come back. She would leave London, too. She knew that. But go where? Wander the world aimlessly? Forever lost? No, she was no longer lost. The fog had lifted. The road was revealed. The journey ahead was clear. She would go home. Home. As she thought this, she felt a warm glow in her heart. She would go back to California. Back to Los Angeles. All these years she had been running away fleeing who she was, fleeing the only thing that gave her meaning. Now, finally, she would confront her destiny, embrace it. She'd go back to Hollywood, where she belonged, and go back to work. Lana felt so powerful now, rising like a phoenix from the ashes, strong and fearless, alone, but not afraid. There was nothing to be afraid of. She felt, what? What was this feeling? Joyful? Yes, joy. She felt full of joy. Lana didn't hear me enter the kitchen. I had come into the house through the back door. Silently making my way along the passage, I heard them, in the kitchen, congratulating themselves on their successful production. There was laughter, and the sound of champagne corks popping. As I walked in, Agathe was pouring champagne into a row of glasses. She didn't see me at first, but then she noticed a couple of wasps on the counter. She looked up. She saw me standing by the door. She gave me a strange look. It must have been the wasps on me that made her look at me like that. Water taxi will be here in 20 minutes, Agathe said. Go get your stuff. I didn't reply. I stood there, staring at Lana. Lana was standing apart from the others, by the window, looking out. I thought how beautiful she looked in this early morning light. The sun outside made the window glow behind her, creating a halo around her head. She looked like an angel. Lana, I said in a low voice. I sounded calm. I looked calm on the surface. 
but in the padlock cell in my mind, where I kept him prisoner, I could hear the kid, rising up like a golem, wailing, screaming, battering the cell door with his fists, howling with rage. Once again abused. Once again humiliated. And worse, much worse, all his darkest fears, all the terrible things I'd promised him weren't true, had just been confirmed, by the only person he ever loved. Lana had exposed the kid, finally, for what he was. Unwanted, unloved, a fraud, a freak. I could hear him breaking free, bursting out of his cell, howling like a demon. He wouldn't stop screaming. It was a horrifying, terrifying scream. I wished he would stop screaming. And then I realized it wasn't the kid screaming. It was me. Lana had turned around and was staring at me, alarmed. Her eyes widened as I took the shotgun out from behind my back. I aimed it at her. Before anyone could stop me, I pulled the trigger. I fired three times. And that, my friend, concludes the sad story of how I came to murder Lana Farr. Epilogue I had a visitor the other day. I don't get many visitors, you know, so it was nice to see a familiar face. It was my old therapist, Mariana. She had come to visit a colleague here but she thought she'd killed two birds with one stone, and she popped in to see me, too. Which lessened the compliment somewhat, but there you go. These days, I must take what I can get. Mariana looked well, considering. Her husband died a few years ago, and she was heartbroken. Apparently, she completely fell apart. I know how that feels. How are you? I said. I'm okay. Mariana smiled cautiously. Surviving. And you? How are you finding it here? I shrugged and answered with the usual banalities about making the best of things, that nothing lasts forever. Plenty of time to think. Too much, perhaps. Mariana nodded. And how are you doing with it all? I smiled but didn't reply. What could I possibly say? How could I begin to tell her the truth? As if reading my thoughts, Mariana said, Have you considered writing it down, everything that happened on the island? No, I can't do that. Why not? It might help to tell the story. I'll think about it. You don't sound very enthusiastic. Mariana, I smiled. I am a professional writer, you know. Meaning? Meaning I only write for an audience. There's no point otherwise. Mariana looked amused. Do you really believe that, Elliot? There's no point without an audience? She smiled as something occurred to her. That reminds me of something Winnicott said about the true self. He said it is only accessed through play. I misunderstood what Mariana meant. My ears pricked up. A play? Really? Not a play. Mariana shook her head. To play. The verb. Oh, I see. I said, losing interest. He meant our true self only appears when there is no one to perform to. No audience, no applause, no expectation to be met. Playing serves no practical purpose, I suppose, and requires no reward. It is its own reward. I see. Don't write your story for an audience, Elliot. Write it for yourself. Mariana gave me an encouraging look. Write it for the kid. I smiled politely. I'll think about it. Before she left, Mariana suggested I might find it helpful to talk to her colleague, whom she'd come here to visit. You should say hello to him, at least. You'll like him, I'm sure. He's very easy to talk to. It might help. Perhaps I will, I smiled. I could certainly use someone to talk to. Good. He looks pleased. His name's Theo. Theo, is he a therapist here? No, Mariana hesitated. For a split second, she looked embarrassed. He's an inmate, like you. As a writer, I am habitually prone to fleeing reality, to making things up and telling stories. Mariana once asked me about this in a therapy session. She asked why I spent my life making things up. Why write? Why be creative? I felt surprised she needed to ask. To me, the answer was painfully obvious. I was creative because, when I was a child, I was dissatisfied with the reality I was forced to endure. So, in my imagination, I created a new one. That's where all creativity is born, I believe, in the desire to escape. Bearing that in mind, I took Mariana's advice. If I wrote my story down, it might set me free. As she advised, I didn't write it for publication or performance. I wrote it for myself. Well, perhaps that's not quite true. You see... When I first sat down at the narrow desk in my cell to write, I felt a strange, dissociated anxiety. Once, 
I would have ignored it, lit a cigarette, or had another coffee or a drink to distract myself. But now, I knew it was the kid who was anxious, not me. His mind was racing. He was terrified of this document. Who might read it and discover the truth about him? And what would the consequences be? I told him not to worry. I wouldn't abandon him. We were in it together, he and I, to the bitter end. I took the kid and placed him gently on the single bed beside me. I told him to settle down, and I told him a bedtime story. This is a story for anyone who has ever loved, I said. It was a rather unusual bedtime story, perhaps, but full of incident and adventure, with goodies and baddies, heroines and wicked witches. I must say I'm rather proud of it. It's one of the best things I've written. It's certainly the most honest. And in the spirit of all that honesty, allow me, before we part, to tell you one final story about me and Barbara West and the night she died. I think you'll find it illuminating. After Barbara fell down the stairs, I hurried down after her. I examined the body on the floor, at the foot of the staircase. Once I had made sure she was dead, I went into her study. Before I called the ambulance, I wanted to make sure she hadn't left anything incriminating behind. Perhaps she had written or photographic evidence of all those things she'd accused me of. I wouldn't put it past Barbara to keep a secret diary, detailing my misdemeanors. I methodically went through her desk drawers until finally, at the back of the bottom drawer, I found something unexpected. Seven thin notebooks bound together with elastic. A diary, I thought, as I opened them up. But I quickly realized what I held in my hands wasn't a diary. It was a handwritten play by Barbara West. It was about me and her and our life together. It was the meanest, most devastating, most brilliant thing I'd ever read in my life. So what did I do? I tore off the title page and made it my own. I'm not really a writer, you see. I have no real talent for anything, except lying. I'm certainly no good at writing stories. Let's face it, I couldn't even plot a murder. I've only ever had one story to tell, and now that I've told it, I can't bring myself to destroy it. Instead, I'll lock it away until I'm dead. Then, if everything goes according to plan, this can be published, posthumously. The intrigue surrounding it should make it a bestseller, which will give me a great deal of satisfaction, even from beyond the grave. Joking aside, if you're reading this, then these are the words of a dead man. That's the final twist. I didn't get out alive either. No one does, in the end. But let's not dwell on that. Let us end, instead, as we began, with Lana. I can't believe she's gone, you know. Even now, after all this time, I can't accept it. She lives on in my mind. And when I'm lonely or afraid or I miss her, which is all the time, all I have to do is close my eyes. Then, I'm right back there, a little boy in the movie theater, in the 15th row, and I gaze at her, smiling, in the dark.